Okay, let's look at this tour of the cell. This is kind of a long one, so get ready. First thing, the cell theory. Now, this is this is a, uh, uh, a, s a series of statements that are required for you know life to exist. Basically, uh, you know, we call the. Uh, let's look at the first one. All living things are composed of cells and cell products, or that, or that the organism is a single cell. All right, so the basic unit of life is a cell, which is what the second statement there says. All true life is cellular. So the basic unit of life is a cell. Now, cells can be um, you know, plant cells, animal cells, protozoans, fungi, bacteria. And there are even some smaller than bacteria. They're called mycoplasmas, but they still obey all the parts of the cell theory. The last statement, all cells come from pre-existing cells through some type of cell division, usually mitotic. So cells do not just become you know, into existence. It's not uh, spontaneous generation like the old, old days used to believe. Uh, just like animals, if they don't reproduce, they cease to exist. And so all cells come from pre-existing cells. The cells are just dividing, and we have a chapter on that a little bit later on cell division. Uh, the light microscope. Uh, light microscopes uh, pretty much were uh, built around the 1600s. Um, they weren't the same as what you see on this screen here, but I have another one in just a minute we can look at. Um, there's some, some properties of microscopes. Basically, microscopes magnify. So magnification is one of the uh, attributes to microscopes. They can enlarge objects, and that's all magnification is, is to enlarge an object. Now, the other part of the microscope's ability is to show an image as being very sharp and distinct, clear, and that's called resolution. It's the ability of the lens system to reveal fine detail to show objects as being separate and distinct, to sharpen an image. Contrast is how the specimen that you're looking at stands out against the background. If you were using a microscope, you can control the amount of light. And too much light, it kind of floods out what you're looking at. Too little light, and it's too dark, you really can't see it very well. So you adjust the contrast to where the background is just right. You can see what you're looking at. The components, the colors are all nice and crisp. Now the resolution of this microscope is 0.2 micrometers. That's extremely small. It's a thousand times better than the human eye can resolve or see something. So microscopes uh, limit of resolution of the light microscope, the one you would use in lab, is a thousand times. Uh, you'll you'll get that in lab. It's going to be the power of the ocular, the eyepiece, times the power of the objective, the uh, lens that you're using to magnify at different uh, magnifications. Here is uh, something I found on the web. This is Layman Hooks microscope, and I wrote a little paragraph here you can read. But you can see this has a handle that the specimen is. You hold this microscope. This is one of the first ones by this little handle, and you can screw it, and it raises or lowers the specimen, which is on that pin. And that pin tip is right behind a little hole that has a little small glass lens in it. The other screw, you can see projecting out to the right, moves the specimen back and forth. So this uh, first microscope could raise and lower the specimen in front of that lens, or move it forward and backward to uh, resolve or sharpen the image. So you can you can read this. This is just one of the first ones. They were made out of copper, bronze, silver. Uh, the transmission electron microscope. Now this type of a microscope, an electron microscope, does not use white light. It doesn't use a light bulb like we can see. It uses a bulb or a device that emits electrons. Uh, so that's why it's called an electron microscope. So it's not using light. Look at the resolution. 
two nanometers. This is 20 angstroms. We measure wavelengths of light in angstroms. So we can get very, very uh, small uh, measurements there. You can see very small things inside of cells. It's a thousand times better than the light microscope. By using a beam of electrons, this microscope can magnify a thousand times what you can see on a light microscope. So a thousand times a thousand, that's up to a million magnifications with this electron, uh, this transmission electron microscope. Because of that, we can see structures in the cell that there's no way we could see with a light microscope. Even if we tried to stain it, you could not see it. So this is for ultra structures. So it uses a beam of electrons uh, and electromagnetic lenses are not glass. There's a magnetic field that they can adjust to bend the beam. And that beam is going to hit the specimen. Well, the specimen has to be coated with heavy metal stains like um, lead, silver, gold atoms will be vaporized to cover the specimen. Because those electron beams will vaporize it if you don't have something protecting the tissue. Now, when the beams of electrons go through, that's going to be a dark shade. And the ones that, um, I mean, yeah, the ones that uh, go through are going to be light. The ones that come back are dark. So you can outline what you're looking at. Uh, this is like trying to throw a BB through a picket fence. goes through real easy. Compared to light, trying to throw a basketball through a picket fence. You don't see the ultrastructure. You can't see there's a space in between those planks on the fence. With the BB, yeah, some of them are going to come back. Some of them are going to go through. So we use this for uh, showing ultrastructures. This is very, very small structures. Now, in a normal microscope, you can see the nucleus and you can see the cell membrane. And that's about it. Uh, just, just on a cell that's not dividing. Uh, but with the transmission electron microscope, you can see stuff like uh, mitochondria, which are extremely small, uh, real lysosomes, uh, Golgi, which we'll talk about in this chapter, endoplasmic reticulum, ribosomes. You can see a lot of stuff. You can see stuff inside of the uh, nucleus, like the chromatin inside of nucleus. So electron microscopes, this transmission one, a thousand times better than a light microscope, up to a million magnifications. Here are some uh, images from the transmission electron microscope. And this one upper left, this is a chloroplast. This is uh, the structure inside of plants that's responsible for photosynthesis. And you can see some ultra structures in there that we will talk about when we get to photosynthesis. The upper right is a mitochondrion. You can see that structure, it's like a little peanut with the lines in the middle, we'll talk about what those are. And you can see some little parallel uh, tubules here. Those are endoplasmic reticulum, you can see quite easily. The lower left, you can see uh, these circular structures or ribosomes, these big ones. Uh, and I mean, sorry, those are mit mitochondria, the big ones. And then this, uh, these tubules that are bent, like a stack of pancakes kind of bent over there. That's called a Golgi complex. And this is... Uh, Something we'll look at in here too. Viruses, the bottom middle. These are some virus uh, particles. The bottom right. These are some cilia. Or, yes, yeah, it's going to be cilia that they've been cut in half. So you're seeing a cross section <coughs> of these cilia. There's no way you would see this with a light microscope. But there's a second type of an electron microscope. It's called a scanning electron microscope. <coughs> Excuse me. And with a scanning electron microscope, you don't get quite the magnification. You see it's around 500, uh, around 50,000 times. But with the scanning, you get high resolution 3D images. So you can see these are the ones that you see in magazines where you see uh, upper left one, there is a uh, thread going through a needle. Uh, the next one over is an ant's head. Next one, showing some bacteria. These are called bacillus. Uh, the far upper right is a house fly. The lower left, that's pollen. The middle, bottom, those are red blood cells. And the one on the uh, bottom right, that's uh, Velcro. But you can see that there are 3D images. So you see surface detail. And that's what you use the scanning electron microscope for. Both of these microscopes are typically, they typically require um, the specimen to be in a vacuum 
Now what a vacuum does is it removes all the floating debris, all the, the dust in the air, so that the electron beams are not deflected when they hit that dust. That there's no dust, there's a vacuum, and in a vacuum everything falls out. Something else about these, you can see that on these, they have colors. Now that's something you can do to electron micrographs, is you can colorize them, and we'll see several colorized and non-colorized specimens in this chapter. But colorizing makes things stand out a little bit better. And so you look at that thread, it's colorized, the bacteria one, colorized against the background. Even that, uh, that house fly is colorized, and the red blood cells are colorized. Difference between prokaryotic cells and eukaryotic cells. The first thing in most definitions has to do with the membrane. Prokaryotes have no nuclear membrane. Their DNA is floating around free in the cytoplasm of the cell. Eukaryotes do have a membrane-bound nucleus, so the uh, DNA is contained in a membrane-bound structure called the nuclear envelope. Prokaryotes have one chromosome, and it's a loop. It's a circle. So they have one chromosome, and it's a loop. Eukaryotic cells, their chromosomes are linear, and they have many, more than one. Humans have 46. Prokaryotes, no, no membrane-bound organelles. This is going to get a little repetitive because, yeah, they don't have any membrane-bound organelles, like the nucleus, no nuclear membrane. Eukaryotes do have membrane-bound organelles, like the nucleus, uh, lysosomes, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi. We'll look at those in this chapter. They all have membranes around them. Prokaryotes do not have histones. Histones are proteins which will uh, coil up the DNA, wind it up into compact units called chromosomes when the cell is getting ready to divide. Well, eukaryotes do have histones. And that's how we can see when a cell is dividing, the histones will wind up the DNA, which previously is in long, thin strands called chromatin. And it shortens them, it coils them up into short, visible units we call chromosomes. So the histones are responsible for the uh, DNA being allowed to be coiled up in eukaryotes. Prokaryotes, uh, don't worry too much about the ribosome structures here. There are different sizes is basically all that is. Prokaryotes have two units, I think it's a 30 and a 50, and uh, eukaryotes have a 60 and a 40, something like that. Um, prokaryotes, no endoplasmic reticulum. That gets about, back to membrane-bound structures. They don't have those. Eukaryotes do have membrane-bound structures, so they have endoplasmic reticulum. They are a... Uh, uh, a tubular network, a membranous tubular network that runs throughout the cell from the nucleus to the cell membrane. Prokaryotes are quite small, 2 to 10 micrometers in, in, dia in uh, size, you know, di like diameter or length. Eukaryotes, 10 to 100, quite a bit larger. So bacteria are awful small. That's why we have to use a microscope to look at those. And usually, most of the time, you'll be going up to 1,000 magnifications. So you can see them better, see the, the shape of them and the arrangement of them better. Whereas in eukaryotes, usually 400 magnifications is the, is the max you really have to do for that, for all the other cells. Prokaryotes are in the kingdom Monera, which is now two domains, bacteria and archaea. Whereas the other four kingdoms, uh, animalia, plantae, fungi, and protista, they're all in the domain eukarya. So we look at two different types of eukaryotes, plants and animals. Plant cells, animal cells. Plant cells have a cell wall around their cells. It's a cellulose wall that prevents the cell from overexpanding. It's what makes things like fruits and vegetables firm. You know, they have a, this, they're, they're a firm structure, whereas animal cells do not have plant cell walls. So animal cell tissue is somewhat... Uh, as far as just the like like skin and muscle, uh, uh, it's kind of soft. So animal cells have no cell wall, no cellulose. Plant cells do have a cell wall, a cell wall around, a cellulose cell wall around the cells. Plant cells have something called a central vacuole, 
which is between 75 and 95 percent of the volume of a plant cell. It's in the, usually in the, somewhere in the center of the cell. Animal cells do not have central vacuoles. We don't have any membrane-bound structure called a vacuole, whereas plants do. Plants have plastids. Some of these plastids are just for color, and some of them are for photosynthesis. Animal cells do not have plastids. Now, we do have melanocytes for color, but those are not plastids. Uh, plant cells, they do not have a structure called centrioles. These are going to be only found in animal cells. Plant cells don't have centrioles. Animal cells do. And the centrioles appear to be involved in cell division, which we will look at a little bit in this chapter, but more when we get to mitosis and meiosis. Plant cells do not have lysosomes. The word some means body and lyso means to destroy, destructive bodies. These are packets of enzymes, membrane-bound uh, uh, vessels of enzymes. Plant cells do not have those. Animal cells do, especially your white blood cells. So when they engulf a bacterium to help uh, rid your body of a bacterial infection, uh, when the bacteria is brought inside the cell, these packets of enzymes called lysosomes are brought over and they fuse with the membrane around the bacterium and dump the enzymes in and the bacterium is digested. It's broken down. This is a, an electron micrograph of an animal cell. You can see it's kind of, you can see stuff. You can see the nucleus here or the nucleolus there. You can see some tubular structures in here, kind of. Those are endoplasmic reticulum. It's a little bit hard to see the mitochondria. But let's look on the next slide where they've got this uh, colorized. I see on this slide you can see uh, quite a bit better. You can see the nucleus is all purple and a structure inside of it called a nucleolus, which is going to be a, a mass of RNA, uh, some DNA, proteins. You can see the tubular network is labeled the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It's called rough because you look at the tubules and they have little black dots on them on the outsides. Those are ribosomes, and it makes it look like a rough tubular structure, so they call it rough endoplasmic reticulum. If you look at the top middle of your picture, it says smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and you can see that these don't have ribosomes. I look at the bottom uh, of your picture, uh, bottom left, it says mitochondria. You can actually see where the mitochondria are in this picture a lot better when it's colorized. And upper left, you see plasma membrane. So you can see the membrane a lot easier when it's colorized also. So colorizing does help you uh, see better on some of these uh, electron micrographs. Here's a uh, plant electron micrograph. And you can see somewhat, you can see the nucleus here in the middle, kind of dark. And you see around the cell, there's a little light zone all the way around the cell. That's the cell wall. The plasma membrane is right up against it on the inside. It's real hard to see on this picture, but uh, and you can see some light structures in there. Those are vacuoles. So let's look at another plant cell that has been colorized. All right, here is one. It kind of looks like a drawing, but it's not. Uh, if you look at the uh, uh, lower left, it says plasma membrane. You can see the membrane on the inside. And look at the bottom right, you see cell wall. It's just pointing to that, that kind of a clear zone all around the cell. That's the cellulose cell wall. And right inside of that, I just showed you the plasma membrane. Now you can see these green structures. It's been colorized. These are the chloroplast. Those are labeled bottom, bottom right. You can see the nucleus. This is purple. They've labeled that as purple. It's, kind of, it's not quite round on this one, but that's the nucleus. And then there's the central vacuole right in the middle. It just has vacuole here, but that's the central vacuole. You can see how it takes up a majority of the inside of that cell, and materials that the cell produces are stored there, like possibly uh, pigments, lipids, carbohydrates, some secretion can be stored in here. But this growing helps to get the cell its, its size, but it occupies between 75 and 95 percent of the interior of most of these plant cells. Cell membranes, a little bit of information about cell membranes. They're a phospholipid bilayer. It means they have two layers of phospholipid molecules, which we've, we've seen before, with embedded proteins. Ah, the integral embedded throughout them. And then on the surface, inside and outside, were the peripheral proteins. 
uh, many cell types or many types of submembranes and cells. The cell membrane on the outside, vacuolar membranes that surround vacuoles, like the uh, digestive vacuoles, you could say, or, or the, even the uh, central vacuole. Membranes of organelles, the, the uh, nuclear envelope, that's a membrane. The mitochondrial membrane, there's two of those, it's an envelope also. The uh, Golgi have membranes, endoplasmic reticulum have membranes, other little vesicles like lysosomes have uh, membranes also. Uh, cell membranes are involved in the movement of materials across the membrane. If you remember, the cellular membrane is selectively permeable. Okay, so it's selectively permeable. It's also called semi-permeable because it's, it, it regulates what goes in and out. So the membrane does determine what can go in and out, and it does that by way of having these proteins embedded in the membrane. The membranes create closed, unique environments, like what's inside the nuclear membrane is the DNA of the cell. What's inside of the uh, mitochondrial membrane, that's, where the, that's, that's called the site of ATP synthesis. What's inside of the lysosomes, those are hydrolytic enzymes. So they do create closed, unique environments. And what's going on inside of those closed, unique environments is pretty much the only place in the cell that those events are taking place or that those structures are found like the DNA. So membrane provides surface for the attachment of enzymes. Some of those proteins are like glycoproteins and glycolipids serve as receptor sites, even the proteins do, uh, for messages from other cells. Uh, and when that messenger molecule, which they'll call a signal molecule or a messenger molecule or a ligand, L-I-G-A-N-D, when they attach uh, to those proteins or glycoproteins or glycolipids, they can be altered. And they will also trigger a response to happen either to the cell membrane or inside of the cell. Uh, the structural component of most organelles, that's kind of redundant of something we just talked about, like the first, second, third uh, topics here. They are the structural component of most of your organelles, not all of them, because there are some organelles like the centrioles. Uh, those don't have membranes around them because they are something called microtubules, and we'll see those a little bit later also. Involved in many cell-to-cell -cell interactions, we'll see how the cell membranes uh, interact with the surrounding cells, membranes around them. That's one of the last things we'll cover in this chapter. Here's a good cell membrane. You see the good phospholipid bilayer. There it is, two layers of phospholipid molecules. They're yellow and they have little brown tails. They're hydrophobic. The heads are hydrophilic, tails are hydrophobic. You see the integral proteins just labeled there, the ones that go all the way through. You see they shaded them too because the, the uh, the uh, darker, I guess that's blue-green, those are the hydrophilic ends of the integral molecules. They're on the outside and inside where water is. And the center is a lighter color. That's the hydrophobic part of that integral protein. It also points out a couple of peripheral proteins. It only shows two on the inside. It doesn't show any on the outside, but that's okay. Peripheral are either on the inside or the outside of this uh, cell membrane. And they have specific functions and they stay on those sides. That's why we'll talk about the membrane being amphipathic. Amphi, like an amphibian, frogs, you know, they can, they can breathe through their lungs in the terrestrial environment, and they breathe through their skin in the aquatic environment. So they're caused by they're called amphibians, two, two terrains there. Well, these peripheral proteins just on the inside, or just let's say on the outside, they stay there. And so the membranes are not identical. Um, you see the uh, let's see the top middle carbohydrate on a protein. That's a glycoprotein. And then next to it to the right says glycolipid, a sugar attached to lipid tails. And one more thing, look at the bottom uh, right, just off the center, you see cholesterol. Cholesterol is used to make these, uh, these membranes. And these are brown things on here, the cholesterol molecules. So the tails are real light and thin of the phospholipid molecule. So it's these brown structures on this drawing or cholesterol. You have to have cholesterol to make cell membranes. You have to have cholesterol to make your hormones like estrogen and testosterone. So cholesterol is not necessarily bad. It's just bad in high levels. And if you don't take cholesterol in, you're trying to control it from your diet, your cells will make the cholesterol that they need. 
your cells can make anything that they need to survive as long as you supply them with nutrients. Cell size ranges, here's what I was telling you before. Let's look at the eukaryotes, they're pretty big, 10 to 100 micrometers. I told you like, you know, 500, uh, I mean, uh, 400 times magnification is really all you ever have to do on eukaryotic cells. Bacteria, some of them you can see at 400, but to see the structures better, you need to take them up to 1,000 magnifications because they're so small, one to 10 micrometers. And then microplasms or mycoplasms, these can affect bacteria and eukaryotic cells. And look at them, 0.1 to 1 micrometer in diameter. And they do uh, obey the laws of uh, the cell theory. You know, they can, uh, they can divide, they can, uh, they have their own uh, uh, cellular processes to make things. Uh, so they obey the cell theory. Surface volume to ratio. This is a little explanation of why cells can only stay the size that they are. You know, we have our size cells right now. They're the same size basically as a whale or as dinosaurs. Uh, the dinosaurs and whales just have more cells. So look at the uh, the reason for why cells have a limited size that they can that they can uh, be to survive. If the surface area doubles, if you double the size of the cell then the volume increases by a power of three. So you double the size of a cell that it is right now and the volume that the cell has to support for life is three times as much volume. And that puts a tremendous stress on how the cell can handle its resources and in the amount of nutrients that it needs. And so cells maintain the size that they are uh, because that's all that they can support you know, they, they can acquire uh, you know, nutrients and the power usage is such that they can only become so big. If you tried to make them larger, they would die. They couldn't supply the energy needed and they couldn't acquire the resources to stay alive. Uh, so that's what it says here. This means the cell would need three times the resources and energy it previously needed to survive and they can't do that. So they maintain the size that they're able to support. Isolation of cell parts. Now, if you want to study cell parts, they're going to have to find out how you or find a way to get a whole bunch of cell parts. So right here it says, cells must be chemically or sonically burst to release all the cellular components. So they'll get a mass of cells. That's if they're, if they're depending on which type of cell they're, they're looking at. Uh, and they'll, they'll put it in a tube and we'll either chemically pop all the cells or sonically by shaking, burst them all. And so you have a bunch of mush in there. And then they can ultra centrifuge, which means very fast, 80,000 RPMs, that's 500,000 Gs. Yeah, ultra centrifuge the cellular conglomerate, the, the slush. And you get a pellet and supernatant are formed. The heavier materials are in the pellet, like the, the uh, DNA and the cell uh, membranes are in there. The supernatant is going to have some of the lighter things, like your um, centrioles, your mitochondria, that type of stuff. They centrifuge the pellet and the viscous solution and separate the cellular components into layers. Now that would be like the DNA and the uh, 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 the membranes. They can do the same thing with the supernatant in a viscous solution and it will phase out in different layers. Uh, so you have a layer of mitochondria because of their mass and their density. You have a layer of centrioles. So they can, they can separate different structures out by this centrifuge, centrifuging them at very high speeds in viscous solutions. And the mass of the object is going to uh, determine how it uh, is, is spun down to different layers. Lighter ones are going to be at the very top. Heavier ones are going to be slung down to the end of the tube. And so a scientist can then get a pipette and suck out a whole bunch out of a layer of mitochondria. They can get a whole bunch of them. Trying to get it out of an individual cell is going to be just almost impossible. So they have to use this isolation of cell parts and centrifug centrifuging the, the slush to separate all the components. Nucleus, average diameter is five micrometers in diameter. Something interesting, uh, all the cells in your body, every cell in your body except for the, uh, the eggs and the sperm 
all the other cells in your body have the exact same size nucleus because they all have 40, 46 chromosomes. Your eggs and sperm have 23. And we'll talk about that when we get to meiosis. Uh, we, our cells, your somatic or body cells, have 46 chromosomes, the full chromosome number, the 2N number. A nuclear envelope, a nuclear envelope means that it has two layers. It's a double phospholipid bilayer, so it's got two phospholipid bilayers, and in between them is something called the nuclear lamina. Now, the nuclear lamina is um, a protein that helps to stabilize the, or, you know, or give support to that double-layered membrane, which we call a nuclear envelope. And there are also some things called nuclear pores or holes, and they're like 100 nanometers in diameter. So the nuclear envelope has nuclear pores, and that allows communication between the cytoplasm and the DNA inside the cell, and between the DNA inside the cell and the cytoplasm. So messages can come in from the cytoplasm to the, to the nucleus, just ask for something to be made. The pathways inside the nucleus will find the gene that's needed uh, and send out the information back out to the cytoplasm through those nuclear pores. So it's a way of communication between the cytoplasm and the DNA is the nuclear pores. Now chromatin. Chromatin is the unwound DNA in a cell. So when a cell is not dividing, you see just the grainy uh, nucleus, that's the chromatin, the unwound DNA, and all the genes are accessible for whatever the cell needs to make. And in there, in the nucleus, with that chromatin is the histone uh, protein, which will be used later when the cell is getting ready to, to divide. Now chromosomes are only visible when the cell is ready to divide. The uh, Chromatin is wound up by histones into short, compact units called chromosomes so that uh, they can be separated. These are the shipping packages. And in mitosis and in meiosis, chromosomes are formed so that the individual uh, chromosomes can be separated. If there were long, thin strands, you would have stuff get, these chromatins would be getting tangled up in each other and there would be no way to, to separate the different chromosomes. But by winding them up into short visible units, yeah, compact units called chromosomes, they can be separated easily. Also, when the chromatin is wound up into chromatins, I mean, chromatin is wound up into chromosomes, uh, the uh, genes are no longer accessible. So everything has to be made prior to cell division. Nucleolus in there, it's going to be a dark mass inside. That's going to be uh, DNA, RNA, and some proteins. And the nuclear organizers there are things that we're not going to talk about too much, but there are enzyme pathways inside that check your DNA constantly, and some of them are responsible for copying the information off of a gene to make a strand of what's called messenger RNA that will then be sent out into the cytoplasm to be interpreted by ribosomes into proteins. Remember, ribosomes are the sites of protein synthesis. Now, here's an electron micrograph, and you can see the, the big old nucleus here. Let's get this little pointer out. Yeah, here's a nuclear envelope here, all the way around the outside. You can see the nucleolus here in the middle, DNA, RNA, and some protein. And where they've got it pointed out, you see little gaps in, uh, in this uh, electron micrograph. These are going to be nuclear pores. So you just look around enough, and you can see some little gaps there. It's kind of like, look close, you can see them. So you can see that on this slide. And all this inside of here, the chromatin, they had it labeled there in red. The chromatin is in here. You don't see any chromosomes because they are not, this cell is not dividing. When a cell is not dividing, the DNA is in long, thin strands called chromatin. Okay. The nuclear envelope. Yeah, these are things we're going to look at on the next few slides. So let's just look at, let's just uh, move on. We just saw the nuclear envelope, but here's a colorized um, slide here. You can see that they colorize the nucleus, so all this is chromatin inside of here. There's a nucleolus there, DNA, RNA, and proteins. Um, you can see that there is a boundary here, so there is, that is the nuclear envelope around there. You can see the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and it's been colorized, and the ribosomes on the surface. Again, you can see the mitochondria. So you can see the organelles like we talked about earlier, even the Golgi complex 
not too good on this. Well, we have another slide, but we'll see some Golgi a lot better on. Uh, in endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth. Smooth means that there are no ribosomes on it. So it says a membrane network. It's a, it's a membranous network that runs throughout the cytoplasm of the cell. There are tubules and sacs called cisterna. I put, um, I put the, um, I, I kind of drew one here. It's just my drawing. You can see um, uh, it's tubular. And here's the little swellings here called cisterna. And they're going to, whatever is being made inside of here, the, the product is being sent to the cisterna. And it's going to be pinched off and sent somewhere else uh, to be processed. And we'll see that in just a little bit. So the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, see there are no bumps on the outside, no ribosomes. Are involved in lipid synthesis that's that's like phospholipid membrane see they're making new membrane that's being pinched off on that vesicle carbohydrate metabolism some altering of, of uh, carbohydrates be done inside of here and also you know changed uh, and don't worry about detoxification that just means changing uh, from one form to another uh, we'll look at ca uh, calcium ion storage that'll happen only in muscle cells uh, when you get to anatomy we'll talk about that okay Now here's some smooth endoplasmic reticulum, these little uh, circular things. It's not going to be like the next one we'll see. The next one is a classic picture, but you see that these little tubules in here, you don't see any little bumps on the outside. So this is smooth surface. So these are, this is smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes. See these little dots on the outside? Those are ribosomes. Now ribosomes are the sites of protein synthesis. So since they're associated with this membrane and they're on the membrane, they're going to synthesize proteins and thread them down into this endoplasmic reticulum here. You see, I've got them threaded down in here and they're getting collected in the little ends, the cisterna, and pinched off. And there are the proteins inside of these little vesicles. So they synthesize proteins, so protein synthesis. Some of these are going to be secretory like um, oils or hormones. Uh, glycoproteins, sugar proteins for the new membrane because they're also involved in membrane production. Okay, and some proteins. So they're they're pretty active here for for production of uh, of uh, proteins. And we'll look at where these vesicles are going in just a minute. Here's rough endoplasmic reticulum. You see this? Man, you can see all these long tubules, and you can see some of them a little bit better. See these little dots? All those dot, little dots are the ribosomes on the outside of the tubules. And so the sites of protein synthesis, they're going to make proteins and thread them inside of the, of the uh, membranous network here, endoplasmic reticulum. So that's a pretty good picture. That's a classic. I don't know how they got that one. Whoever got that one, it's in most of your textbooks now. Here is a smooth on the left versus rough on the right. Another set of pictures that I found, so you can kind of tell a difference between the two. The smooth uh, does not have uh, anything on the outside. They're nice and smooth tubes, whereas the rough, you can see the little dots on the outside of the ribosomes. Golgi. This was named after a man named Golgi, Mr. Golgi. And they named it after him because he had a hard time proving that he had actually found an organelle. The scientific community kind of poo-pooed him uh, because uh, they thought he had, had bad staining uh, techniques and they were involved in other stuff and you know the big guys sometimes think the little guys haven't really found anything because they're just the little guys well, he actually did find something and once it was proven they named it after him and you can see it's a uh, flattened membranous sacs there's a forming face where these little vesicles from the endoplasmic reticulum that we just looked at are going to come and fuse with and there's a maturing face where new vesicles are going to be pinched off so what does the Golgi do? Whatever's sent to them, it's modification. They modify the molecules, like maybe uh, dehydrate and modify them other ways. And they package it and transport uh, the end products in little new vesicles. So alter phospholipids, that's some of the modification. Modify oligosaccharide portion of glycoproteins, that's again modification. And some of these uh, products that were sent to them are target products, which we call hormones. Target products are looking for a target cell, a specific cell to affect. All the hormones you produce don't affect all the cells of your body. 
Some do, most don't. Here's a, uh, a picture of a Golgi. This is a picture. And you can see the vesicle from the endoplasmic reticulum, rough and or smooth. And they come and they fuse on the forming face of this endoplas of this uh, Golgi complex. And as uh, it moves through, it's, it's altered and dehydrated and changed, modified. And then on this end, you see right here, you see something's being pinched off. And here are some that are already pinched off. These are vesicles that are going to either be used by the cell or they're transported to the cell membrane. They fuse with the membrane and dump their contents to the outside. It could be like an oil or it could be a hormone that's dumped directly into the bloodstream. Here's some nice pictures. Here's a nice one on the, on the right hand side. That's a real big image of a Golgi complex. And you can see our Golgi apparatus. You can see that it's like a bent stack of membranes here. And when you look up here, you see a whole lot, a whole lot of them uh, on this picture. They're just everywhere. But it's easy to see once you know what they look like. It's easier to find things on these electron micrographs. Lysosome. Remember, some means body, lys means destructive. So it's means membrane bound sac contains hydrolytic enzymes. You know, hydrolytic enzymes are ones that are going to break things down by the uh, addition of water. Functions digestion of food. So when you eat, hydrolysis occurs, recycling of cell parts. That can happen too inside of a cell. Program cell destruction. Sometimes these lysosomes at a certain time will burst and release the enzymes inside of the cell and it destroys that cell because those are hydrolytic enzymes and they will break down biomolecules and biomolecules are inside the cell. And that membrane bound structure called the lysosome, the membrane, remember uh, what's inside that membrane is the only place that's inside the cell. But if that membrane bursts, and the contents are released into the cytoplasm of the cell, then it's going to destroy the cell. Certain high human uh, diseases here, some storage diseases, there are some genetic diseases that um, you're missing an enzyme, and that can be lethal. And there's one that has to do with uh, lipids in the brain, and it has to do with an enzyme that's missing out of their uh, lysosome. And so uh, lipids build up into the cell, and the cell eventually dies. Arthritis is an autoimmune type of a response. These lysosomal enzymes are attacking your joints. Uh, so it's a destructive thing on your joints. Autoimmune. It's thought that aging might also be involved with these lysosomes popping and killing cells faster than they're being made, something like that. So they're, you know, they're involved in aging as far as the scientific community has stated. Vacuoles. These are membrane-bound structures, and they're different types. Uh, food vacuoles, these are going to be like uh, in protozoans in particular, when they engulf things, or phagocytic cells can engulf, but it's, it's just for protection. Contractile vacuoles, like in protozoans, we will see this on the next slide, a little protozoan that lives in water. Uh, it has to have a contractile vacuole to absorb the water that is leaking into it and to squirt it out of the cell, otherwise it'll pop. And so we have a special type of a vacuole called a contractile vacuole, which is kind of like a bilge pump on a boat. It gets rid of excess water. Central vacuoles in plant cells. Well, the membrane of a central vacuole is called a tonoplast. Tonoplast. And I have it labeled on one of the next slides we'll be looking at uh, so you can see it. Um, central vacuoles for food storage. Okay, so storage of things like um, uh, food. <laughs> Nutrients or possibly waste materials uh, could be stored in there because sequester dangerous metabolites, you know, part of their met metabolic process that could be stored in there and then then uh, altered to where it's non-toxic or altered to some other molecule. Uh, they can store pigments for plant colors. So uh, remember I told you that they have that plant cells have plastids. Well, the reason that uh, apples are red, these vacuoles have red pigment. You know, oranges are orange, orange pigment. Uh, bananas yellow, yellow pigments. So plant colors, flower color, petal colors, like you know, red or yellow or white. White doesn't have any. Uh, protection from predators. The materials inside of these vacuoles could be very bitter. Now most animals, once they try something, 
uh, and they they these uh, vacuoles pop in this really nasty taste, and they won't try that again. And so it's a way of protecting the plant. One thing that we do, uh, we that we like that the plant's trying to protect itself is like jalapenos. When we eat jalapenos, that burns, but you know it's a good burn for making like nachos and putting on your burritos and your tacos and stuff. Here is a protozoan. Uh, here's water all around it, and here are some contractile vacuoles that are collecting water to squirt out of the cell because this is an aquatic environment water is going to leak from the environment through the membrane and tie into the cell and if they can't get rid of it the cell will pop and so they have contractile vacuoles that collect excess water and squirt it back out to the outside constantly here is I labeled this one see tonoplast that's the uh, membrane of the central vacuole is called has its own name is called a tonoplast peroxisomes um, okay we can talk about peroxisomes and glyoxisomes peroxisomes are in animals and they're a, a membrane bound structure um, it says peroxide producing oxidases they contain catalase and catalase is used to break down hydrogen peroxide which is one of the byproducts of cellular uh, metabolism uh, but we have an enzyme that will keep that under control it breaks it down so you see functions break down fatty acids okay can break down fatty acids and converts uh, into water and oxygen well converts hydrogen peroxide and even some of the byproducts of fatty acids into water and oxygen when you get a cut if you've ever put hydrogen peroxide on a cut some of these peroxisomes were damaged in those cells that were that were cut and when you put the hydrogen peroxide on there, you see it, it bubbles. That's because the catalase has been released now because of the, the cell's been damaged. Break the hydrogen peroxide down into water and oxygen. So those are bubbles of oxygen you're seeing. Now, glyoxisomes have something similar. It's a similar structure. It's a packet of special um, enzymes, peroxides. And plants possess the enzymes to produce intermediate products for the synthesis of sugars. So there are lipids inside of plant seeds that contain a lot of energy, and these glyoxisomes have the enzymes that convert those lipids into sugars. And the sugars, says by gl gluconeogenesis, the formation of new, a new glucose, new sugars, are used for the seedling to develop the little plant. And then once the plant can photosynthesize, it can take, it can, uh, it doesn't need any more of the uh, materials on the seed. Mitochondria. Now the mitochondria are also a double membrane bound structure. So they have an inner, an inner and an outer membrane. Now the, uh, the membranes that we're going to see on another picture are shaped a little bit differently. We'll look at the inner membrane. It's a little bit different than the out and I'll tell you why. Now something else. Mito mitochondria contain their own DNA and ribosomes. And so do chloroplast in plant cells. So both chloroplast and, and mitochondria have their own DNA and ribosomes. They can, they can copy themselves when they need to. They can divide when they need to. Now, there's a reason that scientists have come up for that, okay? And this is going to be a theory. Remember, theories, you have a lot of data, but you really can't prove anything. Okay, here's the theory because, you know, this DNA is also circular, okay? Um, and bacteria have circular DNA so here's the theory of endosymbiosis E N D O S Y M B I O S I S and basically the theory of endosymbiosis states that sometime in the primordial past when cells were being formed there was a relationship that a symbiotic relationship developed between the primordial plant cells and primordial animal cells and bacteria. So bacteria developed a relationship with animal cells and bacteria developed a relationship with uh, plant cells, animal and plants. Now what, what the theory is based on is that the bacteria had a place to get nutrients. It could live and had nutrients, a place to live. Well, the bacteria also produced something that the cell could use. They produced ATP, and the cell could use that as an energy molecule. And so 
the theory states that basically that over time it became an insepar inseparable symbiotic relationship. And so that's why uh, scientists say that uh, animal cells have uh, mitochondria, plant cells have chloroplast, and it's because of the theory of endosymbiosis. Now we're going to look at these structures on, on the next uh, two slides. So let's, let's just look at these structures on the next couple of slides. Here is an electron micrograph showing, elect showing a mitochondria. It looks like a little peanut here. Uh, it has two membranes. The outer membrane is forming the outer wall, and the inner membrane is forming these little folds that go in toward the middle. These are called Christi, and the Christi increase the surface area for the production of ATP. Now let's look at another picture. Here is a, kind of like what our model looks like in lab, but you see that there's an outer membrane on the outside, that shell, and the inner membrane on the inside forms these folds called Christi, and it increases the surface area. There's a difference between a smooth membrane on the inside that's just following the same uh, pattern of the outer membrane and this one. There's a lot more surface area on the inner membrane uh, because of the folds. And these folds are called Christi. So the inner, inner membrane forms folds called Christi. And this increases the surface area for the production of ATP. Now over here you have the outer compartment. That's the, the compartment between the outer membrane and the inner membrane. It's also called the uh, intermembrane space, or the inner membrane space, which I have down here on this picture. And that's going to be important. The inner membrane space and the space that the uh, Christi are projecting into, there's a fluid in here, which is not on this picture, but the fluid inside of here that they're projecting into is called the matrix, M-A-T-R-I-X, the fluid in here. Plastids, they are unique to plants. Uh, they're the only ones that have the plastids. There are, they serve many different functions, and I have some of them right here. It shows these plastids. Uh, so let's look at the different types of plastids. One called a proplastid. Proplastid. It says um, small, often colorless membrane sacs that can divide and can mature into functional plastids. Now this uh, means that this plastid is one that hasn't really got a function yet, like a stem cell in animal cells, but it can differentiate. It can become a functional plastid, just like stem cells can become any type of cell in the body, the, in the animal body, like you know muscle, bone, blood. So these are the ones that will form the ones we're going to look at. Now the second one, chromoplast. Chromo means color, so do not contain chlorophyll. Okay, are yellow, red, or orange, provide color in fruit and some flowers. So these are what the chromoplasts provide just colors in flowers and fruits and stuff. Now there are some called leucoplasts. Now leuco means white, and anything that's clear to cloudy, you know, uh, they call it a leuco, they call it white. So leucoplasts is colorless plastids involved in food storage. Okay, so it can be cloudy, but it's still called a leucoplast. Amyloplast, amylo, amylose is a starch, so stores starches. So amyloplast are ones that store starches. Elioplast, this means, uh, that means like oil, store lipids. And proteoplast, not too hard, protein, store proteins. We look at the next plastid. This is the one that we study the most. The chloroplast. Chloroplasts are the sites of photosynthesis. So it says double membrane bound with a third complex network of membranes. So it has three membranes that make up the chloroplast. The thylakoids on the inside. That's the third set of membranes on the inside. So it has an outer membrane, an inner membrane, and another set inside called the thylakoids. Contain chlorophyll and other photosynthetic pigments. The chloroplasts are the sites of photosynthesis. Now, the, the uh, thylakoids involve with the light reactions of photosynthesis. There are two parts of photosynthesis, one that requires light and one that does not require light. So they're both parts of photosynthesis, but only one of them requires light. And that's these thylakoid discs, because this is where the light-dependent part of photosynthesis occurs, is in these discs. So the disc 
there's a thylakoid space inside of the disc, and stacks of these discs are called grana, and we're going to see that on the next couple of slides. The fluid inside of the uh, chloroplast is called the stroma, involved with the Calvin cycle. This is the second part of photosynthesis. This part does not require light. Carbon fixation part of photosynthesis. So we're going to look at this when we get to photosynthesis, but this is the fluid inside of the chloroplast. Remember inside of the mitochondria it's called matrix, but inside of the chloroplast it's called stroma. Here is an electron micrograph. Nice. You can see it. this whole thing is a chloroplast. You see the, the gray stuff in here. That's going to be the stroma. You see the individual lines. Those are thylakoid disks. The individual lines are thylakoid disks. And stacks of them, like a stack of plates, this dense mass here. Each one's called a granum, G-R-A-N-U-M. But grana is plural, so they have grana here. That grana is actually plural. But you can see the dense stacks of thylakoid discs are called grana. Now in this picture, you can see the outer membrane. It's light blue. The inner membrane, this is orange. And the third set of membranes, the thylakoid discs, these are green. Now the thylakoid disc, when you have them in stacks, it's called a granum, a stack of thylakoids. And they are hollow, so you do see the thylakoid space inside. It's a dark space, and that'll be important later. Up here is the stroma, the liquid portion, the fluid inside of the uh, chloroplast. So all those structures can be seen on this drawing also. Looking at a, a, a little uh, image of uh, a plant cell here, this is Elodea. It's going to be a, uh, an aquatic plant. It's one of the ones you put in aquariums. If we were in, in lab, we would put this under a microscope, and you can see that these cells are rectangular. The reason that they all have like a clear center, that's actually where the central vacuole is. And the chloroplast are these little green discs, you can see. These little green discs are going to be moved around and around and around in each of these cells so that each one uh, has the maximum amount of exposure to light that they can get. And so they're going to be sliding and flipping as they go round and round and round. It's called cytoplasmic streaming. That would be pretty cool if you could see that in the lab. Look up cytoplasmic streaming on, online and you look for Elodea and you can see this. It's really pretty cool. Uh, so microtubules, microfilaments, and intermediate filaments. The ones we'll look at the most will be the tubules, and you'll get to mic uh, microfilaments mainly in uh, anatomy. But one thing they all have in common, well, let's look at this first one. Microtubules composed of coiled chains of a globular protein called tubulin. So that protein was named after the shape of this structure, microtubules, and they are tubular. Microfilaments, they're protein fibers, and we will look at, in, in anatomy, we'll look at some called actin and myosin. We call them myofilaments. Uh, they're involved in muscle contraction, cytoplasmic streaming, cell motility. Well, if you look up here at the microtubules, cellular movements, cell shape. And we have flagella and spindle fibers that we'll look at uh, in the cell. So cell shape, we'll look at microfilaments or myofilaments. Cell shape, and look at intermediate filaments cell shape and structural support. So they're all involved in cell shape, and two of them are involved in cellular movements, the my, my, uh, myofilaments and the microtubules. So they all help to form the shape. Shapes of cells can be a variety of uh, shapes, flat, cubes, columns, stars, pyramids, circles, a lot of different shapes. And it's because of these filaments here, these tubules, filaments and intermediate filaments that they have their shape. Here is microtubules. It's a tubule. Microfilament. This is a, a, a filament of actin. It's a double helix of actin. Molecules are twisted there. And I don't think we show one for the uh, filaments, but we do here. Uh, here's the filaments, myofilament, uh, intermediate filaments, myofilaments, and the microtubules. So you can look at that and just kind of get an idea of what they do. But they're all involved in shape, and two of them in, in motility. Cilia and flagella. These are, are microtubules. Cilia, short hair-like extensions. These are uh, cells that will move something around, like in your respiratory tract, in your uh, trachea, yeah, in your nasal cavity, your trachea, uh, your bronchi, the tubes that branch off your trachea to go to your lungs. 
you have cilia that move mucus to the top of your respiratory tract and you cough it out. Uh, that mucus traps dust and debris that makes it past your nasal cavity and it helps to keep your lungs clean. And so you cough it out and either swallow it or spit it out, whichever one. But um, it's a very short uh, hair-like, very short like finger-like or short. Extensions contain nine peripheral pair of microtubules and two central microtubules. When I was in school, we called it a nine-two two arrangement, nine sets of two and two in the middle, and we'll see that in just a minute. Flagella, humans only have one type of flagellum. Now, bacteria have flagella also, but humans have one flagellum. It's a long whip-like organelle. Uh, the internal anatomy is identical, identical to cilia. So they both have the 922 arrangement, but flagella are only found on sperm in animals. Here's an electron micrograph. It's showing the nine, the nine sets of two and two in the middle, the tubular arrangement. And this is a drawing over here for, uh, this is for cilia and flagella. Nine sets of two with two in the middle. And we have some structures called centrioles and basal bodies that are also made of microtubules, but they're in a different arrangement. Centrioles is an organelle located near the base of animal, of animal cells, uh, near the nucleus of animal cells, these centrioles are. They're involved in cell division contain two rod-like structures that are at right angles. And these structures are nine triplets of microtubules. So it's nine sets of triplets. Well, the basal bodies, which are at the base of cilia and flagella, this is what anchors them into the cell membrane. This is the anchor of cilia and flagella. It's called basal bodies. Rod-like structure located at the base of flagella and cilia. They're also composed of nine triplets of microtubules, a little bit different. So down here, here's the 9-3 arrangement of, of the uh, centrioles and the basal bodies, the anchors for the cilia and the membrane. Looking at uh, the uh, way that these cilia and flagella move, these little red things here, it looks like little arms of caterpillars. I wrote this up here for you, so I'll go ahead and read it since I wrote it. Dynenes, these are called dynene arms. You can see a pair of dynene arms, these little caterpillar leg type structures. Uh, has two feet, maybe that's just a you know, term to describe them, that walk along the microtubules, they move. One foot uh, maintains contact while the other releases and reattaches one step further along. So it's like walking. You know, one foot is in contact with the ground at any one point in time when you're walking. These are the same way. Movements of the feet cause the microtubules to bend rather than slide because the microtubules are held in place. So when, when the dynein arms move, they use ATP and they walk basically along the other microtubules. It causes the tubule to bend to one side and then that'll stop and they'll walk the other way and it bends to the other side. So these go back and forth and it occurs quite rapidly, okay? Here's another picture just showing these dining arms on the left, and you can see them right here on the, on, the, on the right side. And so when ATP is used, they move or walk along the microtubules beside them, and it curves the cilia and flagella one direction, and then they stop and they go the opposite direction, and it flips it back the other way. And that happens quite rapidly, so the cilia and flagella are moving pretty fast. This is showing like a sperm tail. You can see it's wiggling. That's for movement. And all these cilia on this protozoan here, this is a paramecium, flipping back and forth, back and forth, very fast as these dynein arms walk up and down the tubules, causing them to bend. They do use ATP. Here are the centrioles, nine sets of three. They're at right angles to each other. These are involved in uh, cell division. You can see here's an electron micrograph of them. Nice. Side shot and a head-on shot. Side shot would be like looking at like this. Head-on is looking at the end. But they're at 90 degrees to each other, and they're involved in cell division. The cytoskeleton. This is the framework, the skeleton of the cells, what gives them their shape, composed of the microfilaments, the microtubules, and intermediate filaments. Remember, they all are involved in cell shape. So they provide the cell shape and structure what the cell looks like. It, it, its shape is a reflection of its function also. Uh, skeletal muscle cells are long, like little long cylinders like pencils. Um, cardiac cells, they branch. 
and smooth cells are tapered. They're like little uh, pieces of spaghetti with tapered ends. Uh, and then different, different cells have different shapes. Provide attachment points for the cell organelles. Uh, they do. These uh, filaments that are running throughout the cell can move things around in the cell. They can move the nucleus around, mitochondria, uh, lysosomes. They can move those structures around. And you've seen that before in time-lapse images of uh, cell division, where things are happening and the chromosomes are lining up and then they're separating and then the cell divides. All that cellular movement by the myo microfilaments and, and uh, microtubules. So they can attach to things and move them around. So it says facilitate cellular movements, yes. And even in that uh, LOD, when you look that up, uh, cytoplasmic streaming, you'll see cellular movements there for sure. Here's uh, some special stains. These are fluorescent stains. Uh, they don't use uh, regular stains. They use a fluorescent light uh, instead of white light, and it makes these stains glow. And so they've stained, you can see they've stained all these micro uh, tubules in here, and this is the nucleus. So they're holding the nucleus in place. They're holding it in place inside the cell as they hold other structures inside the cell, and if it needs to be moved, they move it. So it's a, it forms a framework inside the cell to uh, hold and move the organelles around. And this one over here on the right, you can see they're just forming the shape of this one. Now, I'm imagining this one is a, uh, a, uh, a giant multipolar neuron because of the way it's shaped. You know, it has extensions coming off of it. And there you can see the nucleus inside. So you can see the tubules inside of here. Fluorescent stains. Here's a uh, plant cell. And it says the non-living protective structure on the outside is the, of, the, of the cell membrane is the cell wall. The cell wall is made of cellulose. The cell wall is not living. It's the non-living protective structure outside the cell membrane. The outermost living part of any cell is the cell membrane. So when you look over here and you see um, primary cell wall here, and you see the middle cell wall, uh, these are all just cell wall stuff here. This would be like the cell membrane. Uh, that's just some more cell wall. Okay, the cell membrane is going to be right up against here, and this is the cytoplasm of the cell. So that's about it. We'll talk about plasma desmata in just a minute. But the, mainly the thing, the cell wall is, cyto, is uh, made of cellulose, and it's the non-living protective structure outside the cell membrane. Some intracellular junctions here. This is the last thing in this chapter. Uh, some structures called desmosomes. These are physical links between, I think that means next to each other, animal cells by protein filaments passing through the membranes of both cells and being embedded in a protein plaque on the inside of both membranes uh, in animal cells. So when we look on this next slide here, oh, we'll go back just a second. Uh, we'll see it on, on the slide in just a minute. We'll, we'll point them out again. Tight junctions, this is going to be like in your digestive tract where you have enzymes and acids that are digesting the food in your digestive tract. Well, you don't want those enzymes and acids to get to you. Those enzymes and acids that are in your digestive tract break down biomolecules. Now, you are made of biomolecules. And so these tight junctions prevent those materials from getting from your digestive tract down to you. And when you have like an ulcer, that's when you have a problem of those having access to your tissues below. And that's, that causes problems. So contacts that result in the formation of a leak-proof seal between adjacent cells, cells next to each other, result from the fusion of two membranes into one in animal cells. So the membranes are fused together so nothing can get in between the cells. Two more intracellular junctions, and we'll look at them on the next slide. Uh, gap junctions. In this interaction, a protein tubule spans the gap between adjacent cells, facilitating or helping, assisting the movement of cytoplasmic materials from one cell to the other. Now these, that's what is called in animal cells. They're called gap junctions. They're protein tubules that allow the cytoplasm of adjacent cells to communicate with each other. So the cells remain in homeostasis. They know what's going on with each other. And when one is having a problem, the other one's around it knows. So if one has a virus that infects it, it the cytoplasm of the surrounding cells are informed and they start making something called interferon. So they can communicate with each other. 
Plasma and desmata are the same thing, but this is in plants. Cytoplasmic extensions between adjacent plant cells helps in the movement of materials from cell to cell in plant cells. So these are uh, protein tubules in animal cells are called gap junctions and in plant cells are called plasma desmata. And it's how the cytoplasms of cells can communicate with each other. So let's look at a picture. Uh, this is the cell here and the cell over here isn't drawn entirely, but you can see the uh, plasma membrane here. And this is a desmosome here, like a nice picture here showing these protein filaments that go from one cell across both membranes into the other cell, the adjacent cell. And they have protein plaques. And you can see it's kind of a dark plaque here, which will prevent these filaments from sliding apart. And so the cells can't slide apart. They're like anchors. That's why you can't just uh, get your, your uh, skin and just separate and see your muscle underneath. All the cells all the way around have these desmosomes that keep them from separating, keeps them together. Um, over here at the top, the tight junction, the membranes have fused. It's kind of hard to tell on here, but they fused. It won't let anything that's in your digestive tract out here, let's say, enzymes or acids, get down to you down below here. So it keeps it in your digestive tract and won't let your body be harmed by your digestive process. Down over here are, remember the gap junctions in the animal cells and, and, uh, and plant cells. We'll see a plant cell in just a second. We'll see the, uh, the uh, uh, plasma desmata. But you can see it looks pretty cool here on this uh, electron micrograph. But these are little channels that allow this cytoplasm to communicate with the cell next to it back and forth. Here is a plant cell here. We see plasma desmata. And they've drawn it here. They have a little picture here. You can see plasma desmata on here. And they blew up apart. And you can see the uh, protein channel that allows the cytoplasm of this cell and this cell to communicate with each other. It's kind of hard to see. You can't see it on, on the real picture here, but you can see on the drawing. Here's just some uh, ending, ending of the uh, chapter pictures. This shows some de desmosome. Here's the membranes. Here are the filaments going from one cell to the other. And the plaques, that's a desmosome. Then we have uh, tight junctions. The cell membranes are fused. So these molecules up here in your digestive tract can't get down to you below here. And we have either gap junction, like for, um, this is, this is, I'll just, I just put this on for animal cells. This is the gap junction. Uh, you can see the protein channels between adjacent cells and allows the cytoplasms to communicate with each other keep in homeostasis. These uh, next three slides are just summaries. If you want to read through there, it helps give you a summary of some of these uh, cell organelles and what their functions are, you know, structure and function of several organelles. Okay, so that's your, uh, your lecture for a, a tour of the cell.